Thank you. Good morning. Uh, actually, Clyde has made my first part of my talk much easier. Uh, when we talk about biological embedding of uh, disadvantage, this is a central issue in health disparities work. There are countless studies showing that adults who have less education, lower incomes, or lower on the occupational hierarchy have higher mortality and morbidity. I like his concept of the fire hazard. It may be a new uh, way of measuring the, uh, the field. Uh, you can see thousands of gradients uh, like this. This, this is uh, showing the rates of diabetes on the left, of uh, coronary heart disease. I could just show you slide after slide, specific indicators of SES, specific diseases. And this is all taken uh, as an indicator that poor health is a result of lower SES. But of course, there is also the possibility of the other direction which is that poor health may contribute to lower SES. This is most likely for income. And actually, um, uh, economists are usually the ones who have uh, focused on this, this particular causal direction. And some of the data uh, that has been most convincing comes from older populations from the Health and Retirement Survey that shows, for example, when people become ill, uh, they're more likely to retire early, and you know, therefore their income drops. But reverse causality is less likely for education, which is established early in life and clearly precedes the health problem. So this is uh, one study uh, done on uh, telomere length related to uh, educational advancement uh, within the uh, British system. And this slide shows that even at the cellular, cellular level, greater educational attainment is related to a health indicator, longer telomere length. And this holds even for adjustment for age, gender, occupation, income, and several biological risk factors. It would be hard to argue that your telomere length 20 years later somehow affected how much education you were going to get. Uh, but there is an alternative explanation of how this could happen. It's fairly clear that educational attainment affects uh, adult health, but it may well be Oh, and it operates in part through your adult socioeconomic status. That your health in childhood could, in fact, affect your educational attainment, which then, in, in turn, has these ripple effects later on. However, this is not the end of the explanation, because there's still a question of what affects childhood health. It's not that socioeconomic status is unrelated to childhood health. It's not the child's socioeconomic status yet, in terms of their own income or education, uh, but parental socioeconomic status, which affects uh, the health of their children, as well as also having an effect on, apart from the childhood health uh, pathway, their child's uh, their uh, adulthood, uh, their education, and their SES in adulthood. So if we move back even further, we can see that SES plays a role in the, various early, uh, the earliest environment that children experience, which is the womb. Maternal SES is related to the fetal environment, and I'm going to talk in a minute about the mechanisms by which this could uh, occur which in turn affects many of the health outcomes that we're interested in. The data on uh, fetal origins of disease suggests that adaptations to the fetal environment permanently change structure, physiology, and metabolism in ways that affect disease risk. Children of lower SES parents are more likely to be premature, to be underweight, even when adjusting for length of gestation, to have a higher risk of early mortality, and to have more frequent cognitive and developmental delays. All these things set kids then on trajectories to, on things like the EDI, which will uh, affect their, low, their, their further education and their health in adulthood. Now, the prenatal programming as a result of parental SES may occur via several mechanisms. As I noted, but the, and I'll quickly go through these. Uh, the first is maternal overweight, underweight, and poor nutrition. These are all more common in more socially disadvantaged women, and these have been shown to affect fetal development. 
A second mechanism is through exposure to toxins that can cross the placental barrier and affect, affect brain development and later cognitive functioning. Low SES mothers live in relatively adverse physical environments with hazards such as peeling lead baits, paint, diesel exhaust, industrial emissions, and secondhand smoke, in addition to the mother's own smoking. And finally, both animal and human studies have linked greater stress experienced by the mother with slower growth, impaired immune function, and damage to brain structure and functioning. Although stress is universal, and I think all of us always think that stress is greatest at whatever level of social class we're sitting at, uh, it is in fact more common and acute in low SES populations. These are all individual associations that have been found, and what we have now in the literature is indeed uh, this p pounds and pounds and piles and piles of paper linking one cause and uh, one effect. As we move to put this all together to understand what is it about social disadvantage, it's not just the individual slings and arrows, but it's the combinations of those and the whole context of, of these uh, children's lives that are affecting their development. As we deal in this area, we, there's the constant tension between rigor and vigor. <laughs> In trying to establish causations, most studies take a reductionistic approach where we look very much at one variable at a time, one cause and one effect. Most of the studies, uh, there have been some uh, randomized trials where they look at multiple effects, but mostly we, we do these correlations linking one aspect of SES with one kind of outcome. And these have been informative. For example, Sheldon Cohen's work showing that uh, parental home ownership affects the likelihood that as an adult people will get a cold was very important. Uh, he had uh, adults come in before he sprayed a rhinovirus up their nose and saw who developed a cold. He got measures of their early experience, including the years in which their families owned uh, their house. It turned out that it was in the first five years of life that home ownership seemed to predict uh, whether or not they would get a cold, not, not later on uh, nearly as much. Studies like this help us identify the active ingredients in social disadvantage and are useful for our scientific understanding of child development and also some targets for policy and intervention. However, it's not going to be enough just to accumulate all these individual findings to look at the whole effect of disadvantage. While we need to understand how individual trees grow and prosper, we need to understand the health of the whole forest. Neither risk nor protective factors exist in a vacuum. Uh, this cartoon fo focuses on social advantages and shows that it's no one thing and these things are in fact uh, correlated with one another. The same is true with uh, disadvantages. Children exposed to one type of disadvantage, like poverty, are more likely than, than non-exposed peers to ex experience other disadvantages as well. Greg Duncan, uh, who's in the audience, uh, whoops, well, I think I went a little too fast, uh, uh, pointed out, poverty is associated with other types of disadvantage, such as poor schooling or having a single parent, which makes it hard to say whether the association of poor health with poverty is due to the effect of poverty per se or other linked experience. Using only a single causal variable can lead both to overestimation and to underestimation. Unless all the entwined factors are controlled for, the association with a single, of a single factor with health outcomes may overestimate its true impact because it's carrying the weight for the associated variables. At the same time, the effect of any one factor on health may well underestimate the whole impact of social disadvantage. If, if we reduce the disparities to one factor, we may be underestimating how powerful, in fact, social disadvantage is. The same is true on the dependent variable side. To make precise links between social disadvantage and health, we need to, measure, to link the measure of social disadvantage with biological mechanisms that foster disease. 
So we tend to focus on given diseases so we can understand the pathway. One exposure, one disease. At the same time, we know there are cumulative biological responses to these various slings and arrows that increase vulnerability to a variety of diseases. This is the thinking behind allostatic load, which uh, Bruce will be talking about uh, this evening. Since a relatively small number of people develop a given disease, which may be a factor partly of this vulnerability due to the exposures in, in social disadvantage, but also to your genetic proclivity to that disease, some other ex, uh, random environmental exposures, it may be harder to link a, an exposure with a given disease. So we need to account for the vulnerability to a, a wide range of diseases that, again, will tell us the true power of social disadvantage. So just as we need to account for the complexity, and some would say the messiness, of cumulative disadvantage, we also need to link these to indicators of cumulative overall health. So how do we capture both rigor and vigor? To do so, we need to have both reductionist studies of specific causes and outcomes with vigorous approaches to the entwined risks and multiple outcomes. Now, a few researchers have been trying to do this, uh, largely looking at the development of behavioral and psychiatric problems and considering cumulative risks and adversities. The underlying theory is that exposure to multiple risks, whatever effects they have individually, affects outcomes. In other words, the number of adversities in a child's environment affects the outcome independence of the occurrence of any one risk. The seminal study was done by uh, Sir Michael Rudder, who's with us uh, today. And uh, in the Isle of Wight study, he assessed six risks. What they found was no one risk significantly raised the rates of childhood mental disorders, but the rates increased geometrically with those with a greater number of risks. With two risk factors, children had a fourfold increase and with four risk factors, a tenfold increase in disorders. In a subsequent study, the Rochester Longitudinal Study, looking at 10 risks, the greater the number of risks, the greater the, the probability of problems. Uh, children with eight or more risks had rates of poor academic performance that were seven times as great as those with zero to three risks. This is a very helpful approach, but there are some issues with simply accumulating risk in this way. One is the assumption that each risk is equally important. If you just take a, a summary measure, uh, you're weighing them equally. Uh, if you use the sum, you don't know if some risks are, in fact, uh, more potent. And when only the risk score is used, it doesn't tell us if the number of risks per se matters or if it's the effect of just the accumulation of the risks. So the question is, is there an independent effect of number of risks beyond the impact of the fact that more bad things happen make you more vulnerable to bad outcomes? So recent studies are combining both individual risks and the cumulative total. Uh, this was done uh, recently with the National Comorbidity Survey of the link between childhood adversity in 12 areas and adult psychiatric disorder. Each risk factor was entered individually along with a measure then of the cumulative adversity. And what was found is both the set of individual risk factors and the cumulative score independently predicted the occurrence of adult psychiatric disorder. <coughs> However, unlike the earlier studies where there was a geometric increase as there were more risks, here the, adult, the odds of an adult disorder increased, but increased at a decreasing rate as more risks, risks occurred. It's also worth noting in this one that specific childhood adversities were more strongly related to some disorders than to others, and these associations differed by age. For example, childhood economic adversity related to adult anxiety disorders, but less so to mood disorders. So in addition to these studies linking cumulative adversity to cognitive and emotional environment, we're also starting to see this in looking at physical outcomes. 
Um, there's the National Survey of Children's Health, which is not to be confused with the National Children's Study. Uh, this was a phone survey of, of uh, over 100,000 parents of children age 18 and under. Uh, Larson and colleagues published uh, a study recently looking at the association of four health outcomes in relation to the number of risks reported by the parent uh, regarding their child. As you can see, you have this uh, much stronger association with overall poor health and with uh, poor oral health than with social and emotional problems and over overweight. Again, I think this is an example of what I was saying earlier. Specific problems will not show as strong a relationship as the more global indicators that may capture uh, a range of disorders and problems. However, this doesn't address the independent contribution of the number of risks. Uh, so uh, for this symposium, we, we did a, a little bit of analysis, and we ran two models. The model on the left, and you can see there's a gap to show that they're independent, uh, we first uh, put in each individual risk, and then we put in the, um, the cumulative risks. And if you see, the cumulative risks are particularly powerful and geometric. When you put them all in at the same time, so that they're, uh, you're accounting for the existence of the uh, individual risks, the effect of the cumulative risks go down, and it's only significant for those who have four or more risks. We actually, we repeated these. These are for kids 18 and under, so we repeated them for the zero to five, since that's really the uh, interest in this uh, symposium. And there are a couple of things that I want to point out when we look at the zero to five. One is that overall, if you look at, this is a national sample of kids, 45% uh, had no risks and just under 30 had only one risk. So three quarters of the children were at, at low risk. But a small group of children had multiple risk. And this is very much patterned by, uh, by income of the family. So one of the risks is low income, but if we take that out and we divide it into those who are in poverty, low income, middle income, or high income, what you can see is there's a strong patterning of the other risks that go along with being in low income. So if you look simply at um, those with no risks, the high income uh, group, over 60% have no risks at all and 90% have one risk or less. But if those at the bottom, and this is an underestimate because poverty is one of the risks in addition, uh, those children in the poor and low income families were much less likely to have no other risks. And uh, in fact, only about 10% of children in poverty have only the risk of uh, low income. Conversely, if you look at uh, where the multiple risks are clustered, they're clustered in the, uh, in the families in poverty and low income. So in turn, cumulative disadvantage is related to poor health even at this young age. Uh, I didn't put in the confidence bars, but, and they are, they are fairly large confidence intervals, but there are still significant differences in the children being in poor health depending on the number of risks they have. And you can see, again, it's stronger for poor health than for asthma. So then we re-ran the same analysis, but what happens when you put them in together? And, um, and I didn't make this just to be a complicated slide. It's a little... Uh, a little too much to digest quickly. Uh, in the dark green just repeats the zero to 18. What you can see is for the younger kids, the effects are uh, much weaker, uh, but still there. And interestingly enough, it's mother's and father's mental health that seems particularly strongly related for the zero to five uh, more than for the um, older kids. And uh, when we now put in the uh, cumulative risk, it's, again, in this group, it's, it's not adding uh, over and above the, the individual risk factors. So I think that we, we still need to play with this. We're not quite sure um, how, to, how to interpret it yet. But I, I think this kind of approach where we're thinking about both what the individual risks are, but when you put them together, how does it affect outcome uh, may be a helpful way to, 
engage both rigor and vigor. So in concluding, uh, I think we need both rigor and vigor. In addition to cumulative risk, uh, we're now thinking much more complexly about the early biological embedding. You'll be hearing also about the fact that we're also not just looking at main effects, but interaction effects change over time. Our models are getting much more elaborated and uh, nuanced. As we do this, we need to keep in mind the dynamic relationship between social disadvantage and health. As I was starting out earlier, it's not just that socioeconomic status affects health or that health affects socioeconomic status. For those of you who remember, there used to be an ad for certs saying it's a breath mint or it's a uh, candy. candy mint, and the answer was it's both. And in this case, it's socioeconomic status affects health, health affects socioeconomic status, and it reverberates over the life course. And we do want to be clear when we're looking at individual studies, which part of this are we looking at in which causal direction. This also is, implies that improvements in socioeconomic status will improve health over the life course, but also that improvements in health may enhance socioeconomic position. So in sum, we need both rigor and vigor. Appreciating how powerful social disadvantage is in shaping health across the life course requires data on cumulative adversity and summative measures of health, along with our more reductionist studies. Rigorous research may be more effective in confirming mechanisms, but vigorous research is more effective in capturing the realities of people's lives, and also, I'd argue, is probably more valuable in motivating action, uh, because it really captures the, the the real uh, tenor of, of what it means to be socially disadvantaged and how powerful that is. In the presentations we're going to be hearing in the next uh, two days, I think we'll be hearing both about rigor and vigor and the challenge of the network and other groups that are working as to how to put these all together for the whole picture of social disadvantage. And I'll stop with that. <laughs> <laughs>